All right, you can go ahead and start, Patrick. All right, thanks so much, Jackie. Uh, very excited to be here with you all today. Uh, we're going to be going through the procurement fundamentals, doing business with the city of Chicago presentation. Uh, as the slide says, my name is Patrick Hall, general counsel for the department. Um, a couple quick notes on context and just kind of housekeeping matters at the front end. Um, you see here the uh, department's mission statement. We are committed to communications and outreach. We um, take this very seriously. We want to keep everyone apprised of our opportunities, uh, foster inclusion and competition uh, on our city contracting opportunities, and really want to innovate, bring new programs, and bring along as many people as we can with us. Um, and then also just a heads up, please do download a copy of the most recent consolidated buying plan. That's a very helpful 15 month forecast uh, that includes hundreds of different upcoming contracting opportunities, not only with the city, but for uh, our sister agencies, state of Illinois, Cook County, um, other public contracting opportunities. So really helpful guide there. Uh, another um, uh, thing to keep an eye out for and, and that we would encourage you to access are the resource guides that the Department of Procurement Services has published. There are four different volumes available on our website. That's chicago.gov slash DPS guides. Um, four volumes really hitting on a lot of the main topics that uh, we, we feel are important for the public and vendors to be uh, aware of. And that's uh, kind of the procurement fundamentals, uh, a resource guide kind of related to the subject matter of today's um, workshop, but also incentives and programs, certification and compliance. Um, a lot of really helpful information there in terms of the different programs we have here for, for certification, uh, bid incentives to really increase the value of your bids and compliance, what to look for in terms of managing your fulfillment of uh, any contract goals, workforce goals, and, and associated um, requirements in city. Okay, here's uh, just a high level overview of the goals of our workshop this afternoon. Uh, we'll start with an overview of the Department of Procurement Services, how we organize ourselves. We'll then touch on the laws governing the public procurement process here in the city of Chicago. We'll also touch on some kind of key terms that you'll hear a lot of as you continue to engage with this material and with the workshop, along with uh, the various types of procurements, what to look out for, and kind of at a high level, the important pieces and distinctions between those, those types of procurements. Um, we'll also touch on certification. So that's where we get into um, MWBE certified businesses, how that factors into our contracting opportunities. And then the contract monitoring and compliance portion uh, is kind of a after the fact, uh, how, how does the actual managing the contract and reporting obligations to the city should you win and, and uh, be awarded a city contract? We'll also do a little bit of programs and bid incentives and then direct you to some other additional resources on the DPS website, um, and of course, try to reserve as much time for Q&A as possible. At that point. So to begin, um, just a department overview for the Department of Procurement Services here in the city of Chicago. We are the lead contracting authority for the procurement of goods and services for the city of Chicago itself. So city government, any time it's, uh, or most of the time, I should say, it relies on, on obtaining and using certain goods and services to, to carry out programs for its residents, for, for um, visitors, what have you. Um, a lot of those opportunities will be um, achieved through contracts with the, that run through the Department of Procurement Services. Uh, our goal as a department is to work together as a team and with our customers to guarantee an open, fair, and timely process. Uh, we do that by establishing, communicating, and enforcing superior business. All right, we will next get into the laws governing the procurement process. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, I will try not to be too long winded about these, but uh, certainly a focus of mine. 
um, really two main pieces to be aware of. Um, and and uh, it, it kind of it creates the framework within which our department operates and, and the public um, uh, business uh, side uh, of the equation also has to operate within. Um, those, those two pieces are the Municipal Purchasing Act, that is a state statute. Um, it kind of sets out a kind of broader framework for how cities and local governments can um, enact different procurement practices and obtain the goods and services that we've touched on. Um, and then the Chapter 292 of the Municipal Code of Chicago, that's the city ordinances that govern our purchasing practices here. So think of uh, the state law as kind of the overall framework of it, and then the Municipal Code chapter as um, as how uh, a method through which we've uh, implemented a lot of the that framework that was given to us by the state. All right, next we will get into procurement terms. Um, this is really helpful because there is some, uh, I should say, you know, potentially jargon or, or kind of very specific language that you'll hear repeated quite a bit. So we want to start by kind of going through some of those uh, terms of art and, um, and and that should help kind of and as we get into some more of the technical pieces uh, later on or as you continue to research our practices. The first is bid package. Um, that is just a set of documents that's issued by the city to solicit uh, bids for goods and services. Those bid packages are now all of them exclusively available online through the city's e procurement system. Um, within that, you'll have various requirements. We will touch on some of those. Um, but within the bid package now um, that you'll see online, it will lay all of the various requirements specific to that opportunity. Um, lay all that out. out to you. Uh, the second term here is addendum. Um, it's important to understand a change. Uh, an addendum is a change to the city's requirements in that invitation to bid or request for qualifications or request for proposals. Those are all also uh, uploaded to the e procurement website and system. Um, when they are uploaded, uh, anyone who's indicated that they're interested in a given solicitation will also be sense a notice uh, regarding the addendum and, and kind of changes that might be made and, and invite you to look into it further. But, but those are key to keep on top of if there is an opportunity that your, your business is interested in and that they can kind of materially change what we're looking for in a bid um, and how we expect the goods or, or services to be provided. Next term here, contract. Um, that is our main focus here. We're talking city contracts. What we mean by that is really just a written agreement between um, the city and uh, uh, and city and the vendor for goods or services. Um, there's a number of different forms that those can take, but that's really what it is. It's solidifying that agreement down into writing um, and, and laying out exactly what the city expects the vendor to provide, whether it be goods or services. Um, related to that is amendment or modification. This is a, a document which formally changes the terms and conditions of the contract. Several forms of these, um, you know, they can be a change order on a construction contract where it kind of changes the uh, scope of the project itself based on new information that's found during the term of the actual work on the project. But it can also be, uh, you know, a mutual agreement to extend the arrangements uh, with a given vendor and the contract. It can raise the contractual spending limit on a contract. It can also change pricing, various other terms and conditions. Within it. Right, the next section, we'll, we'll touch on the types of procurements. Um, some of these may be a little technical or, um, or or kind of uh, distinct in a, in a somewhat um, intricate way. So please do uh, feel free to ask questions at the end if, if anything I, I articulate here uh, raises any more questions. The first type of procurement here uh, that we will touch on, um, we'll go through small orders, competitive bids, job order contracts, requests for proposals, and requests for qualifications. 
Um, these are kind of the broad uh, framework for different procurement types that we here at DPS um, issue and, and solicit for the city. Um, first among these is small orders. Um, these are uh, procurement for goods or services that are valued below $250,000. That is a cap uh, set out in statute. So it, it is a low bid solicitation. Whoever provides the lowest uh, price for the providing a specific good or service, um, uh, they their contract will be, um, they will be awarded the contract by the city of Chicago. Um, they're very similar. It's a competitive process where there's no real um, insight into what an, a competitor might be providing for their own pricing until that's all uh, kind of revealed publicly and transparently later on in the process. Um, but the key part here is that the, the contract has to be worth less than $250,000 to be considered a small order. Um, a couple other factors are different in terms of uh, formal advertisement in the paper. These do not require that if they are below that cap. Um, but other than that, they are publicly available for all to respond to. They will also be uh, uh, found on our e-procurement website and other uh, list of DPS alerts and other other uh, forms of public communication that we engage in to, to make folks aware of our contract. Um, Oh, another key key point here is articulated on the slide that MWBE compliance that will be required if uh, a particular procurement is valued at over ten thousand um, dollars. So it's only only contracts uh, valued below that threshold um, that will not have some sort of MBEWBE compliance goals. And we'll we'll break down a little bit more of what those uh, what MBEWBE compliance means later on in the presentation. Uh, but a key distinction there, and that's um, that would be the small subset of, of projects that do not have those goals associated. After small orders, we'll get into uh, we'll, or we'll discuss uh, competitive bids here. That is the uh, I would say the bulk of the work of the department is putting out uh, competitive bid solicitations. Very similar process to the small order process, except that the uh, contracts are valued at over 250. So below that threshold is a small order, above it's a competitive bid or a competitive, a competitive sealed bid. Um, all of those opportunities are published in the newspaper. So there's an advertising requirement, but we also have other means through which you try to make folks aware of these opportunities. Um, you'll see in the classified section of the Chicago Tribune newspaper, other daily newspapers, a listing of all these various opportunities when proposals are, are actually due to the city by um, and other information about what the city expects to procure through that process. Um, and like I said before, a lot of those, all, all those opportunities will be on chicago.gov slash uh, We also do have what's called a bid and bond room here at City Hall on the first floor. Um, Still, some uh, ongoing updates to the room itself, but that is a, uh, a meeting location for things like pre bid conferences and um, bid openings, um, kind of public, uh, transparent parts of our process that we'll touch on a little bit. Um, along with that, that advertisement piece, just to add there too, those will be posted um, for 10 to 30 calendar days. Um, that, that So, there will be kind of a, a broader window within which you uh, can submit. Thanks. All right, I mentioned pre-bid meetings a moment ago. Um, this is an important detail if you are interested in competitive bids, but particularly things like uh, construction projects and, and whatnot that are solicited through this method. Um, Check the actual solicitation documents to determine if that pre-bid meeting is optional or mandatory. It's a very key piece there. Um, you do not want to, to miss these meetings if it is a mandatory requirement for your bid to be considered. Um, and that will all be laid out. So uh, during these meetings, um, all of the various requirements for 
that specific solicitation and the bidding process itself uh, will be touched on. There's the review of the specification, uh, kind of opportunity for questions and answers and, and addressing concerns. Sometimes that can inform um, uh, raise raise something to the city that hasn't been raised previously, leading to an addendum or, or other clarifying questions. Um, but do note that if it if it uh, if it describes the pre bid meeting as optional, then attendance is still very much encouraged. We do feel like these are really helpful uh, helpful meetings, helpful for all to be um, of all uh, aware and, and informed of of all that's expected. Um, for a given solicitation, make sure everyone's on the same page and then everyone goes in uh, fully aware of what they're bidding on and what to expect. Um, additionally, if there is not a pre bid meeting, um, bidders are encouraged to review the specification and the contract documents during that solicitation period. And then contact the DPS contract administrator identified in the bid advertisement um, with any questions that they might have about the documents in front of them. Uh, this is a key thing. Uh, all questions should be directed towards the designated contact. That designated contact will be, uh, you know, stated very explicitly within all the documents and the advertisements. So you, you will have contact information for the person. And, and an opportunity to direct any questions to them that can then be clarified throughout the process, um, even without the pre-bid meeting process that we mentioned. Another important piece here, cannot emphasize enough, um, you are required to fill in all required information. Um, if something is listed in the bid documents as, uh, as a requirement, and it will say as much. Um, those bid documents uh, must be submitted and executed. It's an important piece as well with your bid. If not, your bid could just be outright rejected and not really even evaluated to, to the fullest extent. You'll also need to sign, execute that document and have it notarized. These are all very important requirements, but it's you know given that we're, we're talking about contractual obligations, this is a very important piece of the process to make sure that uh, both the business is fully apprised of what's expected of them, and the city um, understands that you know that we have someone who who has seen all the various requirements, understands what is what is expected of them, and followed through on it. So it's very very important for you if you want your bid to be considered. Bid submittal. Um, sometimes within these required documents. Um, it will designate whether or not a bid bond or a deposit is required. Um, if it is, it will not exceed 10% of the contract amount. And it also must be submitted in the proper form. Um, and on time too, as, as that last point uh, makes very clear. Uh, very important to be aware of. Uh, we do try to uh, work a lot of this on the front end before anything's advertised. We don't want these to be onerous requirements, but there are various uh, laws and requirement, legal requirements in place that necessitate a bid bond or a deposit in some instances. Um, it will not exceed 10% of the contract amount. Of course, um, the bond itself is not necessarily, won't necessarily cost the business that full 10%. It'll probably be 8% of that 10% amount. Um, not to make it too complicated, but um, these are, are legal requirements in some instances, particularly construction projects. Um, and they dem it's a way for the city to evaluate uh, whether your business is, uh, has the financial resources available to complete a, a, con a contract performance um, after that. Uh, another term I mentioned before, bid opening. So um, these will generally be held Monday through Friday around 11 a.m. in that bid and bond room that I mentioned before uh, within the first floor of City Hall. Um, you know, the, these nowadays are with the with the room kind of being in need of some updates and, and um, renovations. They, they are streamed live via YouTube. It's less of a physical gathering and uh, physical uh, 
presence there during bid openings, but we do stream all these and keep these videos uh, accessible to the public um, so that everyone, uh, the process is done transparently and all bidders are aware of um, what's taking place and, and kind of what other bid pricing might have been submitted by, by other folks. Um, process wise, it'll be a matter of, of opening those bids, reading a lot of bid pricing, uh, there's some tabulation and review of the documents for accuracy and completeness. completeness. And then those bid tabulations are uh, uploaded to the GPS website generally within 24 hours after the bid opening. Um, it's another transparency measure. We want everyone to be able to see exactly where their bid pricing falls in relation to other bidders. Um, no surprises around who would be the low bidder. Um, though sometimes things, uh, the actual tabulation process uh, will involve some calculations after the fact if we get into bid incentives and, and things like that. So um, that's an ongoing process as those things are tabulated, but um, accessible to all. all. Right, after bid opening, then we get into what is called the award process. Um, uh, first, there's a determination made uh, regarding whether a bidder is responsive and responsible uh, for that award. That Those are kind of legal terms of art um, first uh, identified in that Municipal Purchasing Act, the state level that I mentioned earlier on. Um, it largely just means that uh, it, responsiveness is, is generally just uh, refers to actually providing all the required information um, set, set forth in the bid solicitation documents. Responsibility is um, what it sounds like. It's it's very much a, a measure of whether a given business is experienced and, and you know, solvent and, and capable enough to perform a given, given project. Um, and so once those determinations are made, we then move into the recommendation of award stage. Um, that is where you know, the, the acceptable bids uh, after the initial evaluation stage are, are evaluated more in deeper um, at a deeper level. And then uh, the lowest bid among them, lowest responsible and responsible bidder will be selected to be uh, uh, for a recommendation of award. That is a, a process that goes, involves both DPS and then the actual department that will be using the goods or services. Um, there's also a process where DPS is, uh, has to evaluate whether the performance and payment bond is submitted and the insurance and, and different uh, uh, requirements have been provided and meet the criteria that we've set out. Um, in some instances, there we do require concurrence from uh, the funding agency. A lot of the times that'll be if a given construction project is funded by the federal government, we do need them to uh, evaluate our process and determine that it was done correctly, but um, not always relevant to our limited uh, bid process. Um, once that uh, awardee has been selected, these bid and contract documents are routed through a signature approval process. Uh, according to law, each of the city's contracts, or I should say the vast majority of them, must be signed by the chief uh, procurement officer, that's the head of our department here at, at DPS, the comptroller, and the mayor. Um, so all three signatures are required for a lot of these. And um, uh, once it routes through that whole signature and approval process, and all three are on there, in addition to the, the business's signature, um, that contract is uh, official and will be is awarded to the lowest responsible bidder. Responsible This next type of procurement is um, a very specific, uh, very specific type of procurement. Um, and so, I please uh, feel free to ask questions uh, once we get to the end if, you, if you're interested in more detail on some of this. But at a high level, uh, a jock contract is a job order contract. That's a a firm fixed price competitive, competitively bid and indefinite quantity contract. That is specifically designed for each department's construction program. Um, so we at the city uh, have a few different departments that each have their own jock contractor. 
Um, this is really a, a method that we use to accomplish small to medium sized projects, um, mostly on an as needed basis. So instead of bidding every small or medium construction type job that that we um, need completed here to operate as a city and developing plans and technical specifications for each one of those departments use a jock instead. Um, and it, it functions very similarly to what we expect of general contractors and in, in the private sector. Um, so we solicit to uh, someone like a general contractor. They respond to the specification. The specification will spotlight a unit price book, um, essentially pricing associated with various construction tasks, uh, description of those tasks, and a unit of measuring you know, price for each one. Bidders then bid a discount for each of those unit prices, and the lowest bidder is determined that way. Shifting gears here, so once we get past uh, small orders and competitive bids are, are both awarded uh, to the lowest responsive and responsible bid. Now we're getting um, into procurement types that take other factors into consideration. Um, and the first one of those is the request for proposals. Um, so this is a method that, we, that DPS used to solicit proposals to implement a new project, generally requiring professional services. Um, if the city doesn't have in-house experts or, or resources to implement that project, um, they will use an RFP to obtain those goods or, or services. I should say. Um, RF, an RFP defines different project objectives and a scope of services. Doesn't necessarily detail every single aspect of implementing the project. Um, it, it requires detailed evaluation of the proposals that we receive by a designated evaluation committee. Uh, based on the criteria that's stated in the RFP. Uh, what this means is that we take other considerations, um, we factor in other considerations beyond low price. So it's not solely the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. It could be someone who appears to have a little bit more expertise or experience in a given professional services category. Um, and then we award the contract to the highest rated and ranked respondents. That's kind of the standard that we're looking for here. But so think of this a slightly different way and that it's not dependent on lowest price exclusively, but it's more the city laying out in, in as much detail as possible what they're hoping to get from a particular vendor providing these services and then selecting the one uh, who, meet, who most closely, uh, who seems most capable of providing particular meetings. Um, similar to that, and um, I get into distinctions here, but uh, is a request for qualification. So this, instead of uh, an RFP, where we're selecting uh, one vendor to meet the city's goals and certain projects, uh, an RFQ is used to solicit qualifications from uh, a number of companies who each possess a high degree of technical expertise and knowledge and specific disciplines. So it, this is essentially a way for the city to pre-qualify companies and build a vendor pool to respond to future task orders. Um, and task orders are just a way to lay out what the city needs on an individual project level. Um, so our evaluation and selection is based on the qualifications and technical competence for each one of the uh, RFQ respondents. Um, you know, this is used a lot for architecture and engineering, uh, design work, things like that. Um, a lot of these, there won't be a cost proposal, a fee schedule will be, you know, negotiated after the fact. Um, and it, but it, instead, it's we're building a pool in the meantime until a specific project is, is needed. And then we sub, submit to that pre-qualified pool, um, you know, exactly what we're hoping to get via a task order. Um, so it's you know, the first step is getting into the pool and responding to the RFQ and being pre-qualified. The second is then to uh, respond to a task order and uh, demonstrate the, the expertise and knowledge that, that will show that you're the best, most capable of, of fulfilling.
next important piece of the process here, um, and this is dictated by both state law and the municipal code, but um, whether it's an RFP, RFP, small order, um, or, or larger competitive bid, everyone who contracts for the city must provide what is called an economic disclosure statement or an EDS. Um, the EDS addresses the disclosure of ownership for that firm. Um, it's now, uh, if it's a contract coming through DPS, those those will be done online. So it's it's certainly a little bit more easy uh, to fulfill that requirement than it, than it used to be. Um, but it's a requirement that anyone who owns more than seven and a half percent interest in the uh, contracting firm or, or vendor uh, must fill out an EDS in addition to the business itself. Um, so this is a way for the there to be insight and transparency around who is actually ultimately, um, you know, owning the businesses that the city contracts with, and um, therefore receiving the money that the city is paying for those goods and services. So, so that everyone is fully aware, the public knows where their tax dollars are going, the city knows with whom, uh, you know, they are tasked with with working with on a project, and and who would be, um, you know, reaping the the benefits of working. The next category, uh, the subject that we'll touch on today is certification. Um, and this is, cert we, we do a presentation and workshop uh, exclusively on certification. So we'll, we'll have to do a, a higher level version for purposes of today's workshop. But um, I'm also happy to answer any questions on these. Um, the, the main thing to understand is that there are six different types of certification. Uh, all of which we are, we have a unit here in DPS that processes applications and, um, and certifies firms that, that apply. Um, the first category, MBE, it's minority owned business enterprise. Uh, WBE is women owned. BEPD, business enterprise owned by people with disabilities. Uh, VBE is a veteran owned business enterprise. And then the two here, DBE and ACDBE, uh, disadvantaged business enterprise or airport concession disadvantaged business. Those are dictated by the federal government. So we certify for them here, but the actual eligibility and requirements for being certified are not something that we have control over here at the city of Chicago. Um, it's, it's a process that's distinct from the others and, and comes into play uh, most directly with federally funded construction projects and other federally funded projects. Um, Still relevant, still useful for businesses to have, um, just slightly distinct from the other programs, and that the terms of of uh, eligibility are are not something that we have direct control over here as a city. For certification, there are some basic eligibility requirements. Then this will apply um, across the board. Um, a business that is seeking to become certified must be at least 51% owned and controlled uh, by either the, uh, depending on MBE, WBP, what have you, whatever the specific category demographic that the certification is catered towards. The business must be 51% at least owned and controlled by qualifying minorities, women's veterans, individuals with disabilities, or other disadvantaged individuals. Uh, we lay all of these requirements out in uh, separate documents that are accessible on our website. Um, and then for particularly the non federal programs, the businesses must also be small businesses and they must be independent. Um, there is a lot of good policy rationale around why we structure programs this way, but just know that the, the gist of it is that we want the businesses to actually be owned and operated by the people whose. Uh, demographics or identifying characteristics, the programs are directed to assist. Um, we want them to actually be the ones owning businesses that benefit from these certification programs. And we want them to be independent and viable to stand on their own two feet, not be part of some larger organization, larger business. Um, we also want them to be small and, and local to some extent as well. So there are size caps on, on which businesses are eligible to be certified in these categories. Um, and that's so that we, when we do set goals on contracts and, and other things like that, 
we know that those goals are going to help smaller businesses grow and gain capacity. For MBE, WBE, and DBE participation, um, you can find out additional details in section 292.420 of the uh, Chicago Municipal Code. Um, that section is, is what sets forth the, the various programs for contracts um, uh, other than construction. So non-construction, I think of consulting and other, um, other contracts not directly related to construction that the city would need uh, professional services, various categories like that. Um, section 292.650 lays out the minority women-owned business enterprise procurement programs for construction contracts. They are distinct. Uh, there's a little bit of a, uh, a history there, but just know that uh, they're very similar in a lot of respects, respects, but distinct in ways that uh, relate to various legal challenges in the past and what have you. Um, but if you are curious to see exactly how that's been codified in our municipal code, those two sections will lay that out for you. And then similarly, uh, 49 CFR part 26, that is just a, a kind of citation for uh, federal regulations that lay out the exact rules for disadvantaged business enterprises on those federally funded projects. So that'll be for, for DBE and ACDBE. Um, any you know details that you may need on whether or not your business might qualify for those certifications can be found in that section of the Code of Federal Regulations. An important aspect to all of these um, certification programs and the goals that end up being incorporated into city contracts um, is that in order to count towards any goals, um, earmarked for MBE, WBE, or DBE businesses, um, those certified businesses must be performing what's called a commercially useful function. Um, what exactly does that mean? It means that uh, a firm performs a commercially useful function when it's responsible for the execution of a distinct element of the work of the contract carried out by actually managing, performing, supervising the work involved, or fulfilling responsibilities as a joint venture. Um, think of this, uh, Brett, I always find it helpful, the example of brokers, um, someone who's purely a middleman who's sourcing goods to then sell to another, another business involved in the project. We don't, um, we don't provide credit towards any MWBE goals if someone is purely certified, but acting as a broker in that scenario and that they're um, not actually performing, managing, or supervising the work, they're just acting as a So that's, that's to me a helpful distinction if we're, if you're wondering what a commercial useful function is, but what, just think of, um, folks actually being involved in the systems. When we set, um, MBE and WBE goals on a project, um, there is a process after the fact, um, what's happening during, uh, it generally happens during the contract closeout or, or after substantial completion of a project. But um, a contractor may be entitled to a reduction or waiver of their goals um, if they make a request to the CBO for a reduction or waiver. Um, in order to actually obtain one and be granted one, uh, from the chief procurement officer, the contractor has to demonstrate that it has made good faith efforts to meet its MBE and WBE organization goals. Um, in, in kind of an example of this, maybe a contract requires that, uh, uh, think of a construction project, and we've, we've designated that 20% of the contract spend must be um, provided to an MBE subcontractor. Um, in order to meet that goal, that means 20% of what's been paid to the prime contractor has to then be paid to MBE subcontractors. If they only hit, uh, you know, 16% of that spend instead of the full 20, their shortfall is going to be 4% of the contract. Um, if they can demonstrate, um, and this is a legal requirement as well, if they can demonstrate that they make good faith efforts 
Um, let's say they, they try to hire another firm to meet those after an, another one of their, the one they plan to use didn't have the capacity to, to fulfill a certain role. They made efforts to recruit and, and subcontract with other certified businesses. That would be considered good faith. Um, but a lot of that requires demonstrating it, um, reporting a lot of information, reporting that back to the city. And then it's um, it's kind of a, a give and take process with us where we evaluate um, to what extent they actually took took those good faith efforts to meet their goals, and to what extent they just uh, were were happy to take the line itself and, and be be docked and and what they're paid. Contract monitoring and compliance. So this relates to the fulfillment of the goals. Um, the monitoring of the actual utilization of MBEs, WBEs, and DBEs uh, that have been listed on a given compliance plan. Um, we monitor that, or we have a unit that does that during the term of a contract. Um, and it it's, relates not only to the certified firm utilization goals, but also compliance with various other legal requirements, including the Chicago Residency Ordinance and Equal Employment Opportunity Committees. Um, those are various workforce goals associated with contract performance as well. All of that is tracked by a unit here uh, through payroll information submitted to the city. Chicago residency ordinance, as mentioned before, it's a workforce goal. Um, this applies to any construction contract estimated to cost the city at least $100,000. Um, and it's also has, must be locally funded. Um, the actual ordinance requires that at least 50% of the total work hours be performed by actual residents of the city of Chicago and seven and a half percent of that 50% uh, of the total work hours must be performed by project area residents. So that is within uh, uh, residents within a defined area near the actual construction site and uh, location of the work. So we've, we've codified these requirements into the municipal code and we track compliance in meeting and attaining these goals during the term of the contract through certified paper. Similarly, uh, equal employment opportunity. Um, it, the goal of this is to promote equality of opportunity for minority and female personnel on city funded construction projects. Um, so, there is a canvassing formula that can be inserted into each contract specification estimated to cost $100,000 or more. So same threshold as the CRO. Um, and bidders are then invited to propose different minority female employee utilization goals. Um, and then while they're working, they do that at the front end during the, the time of bidding. And then if they win the project, they are then required to meet those goals during their work on the project. And we gauge uh, their progress towards that by requiring them to submit additional certified payroll information that we uh, work with them on and assess their, their performance towards those. So the various ways that we actually achieve compliance, um, it can be that the prime itself is a certified firm. Um, it can also be that uh, there's a joint venture between a certified firm and a, a majority form or firm or a non-certified firm. And then you can also, uh, and this is the primary way, the prime contractor is not certified, but subcontracts a portion of the work to one or more certified firms. Um, you can also get some credit for purchasing materials used in the contract from one or more certified firms. Those are kind of the four primary ways that you can meet the goals that are set out. As I mentioned before, we're tracking this during the, the term of a contract, um, during a, a front contractor's performance. They are responsible for submitting monthly subcontractor payment certification form firms, forms, weekly certified payrolls, and waivers of any limits that, that might apply to their work as well. Uh, these are all ways that we can kind of gauge their attainment towards these goals during a, the lifetime of contracts and then also. We use the same information to uh, fully assess their performance after the fact during contract performance. Okay, then this next one is um, also a, a pretty large 
topic, but um, but we'll kind of go over at a high level various programs and bid incentives. Think of these as opportunities uh, by which you can uh, ad adjust your actual base bid amount um, by utilizing a given bid incentive or or program to incentivize certain uh, certain behavior, certain uh, hiring practices, certain other uh, actions by a prime contractor, you can uh, lower what your base bid, is, your base bid number is in relation to the other bids submitted on a project for comparisons purposes. It does not actually reduce the amount you'd be paid for a given project, but um, our, we will adjust after the fact when we are comparing and tabulating those bids and comparing against each other. <clears throat> Uh, the various programs that we use here at DPS, um, these are largely all uh, geared towards trying to uh, designate small, mid-sized local businesses, um, trying to allow them to build capacity and to grow and take advantage of more city contracting opportunities. So there is both the small business initiative, construction programs, a mid-sized business initiative, um, a non-construction version of that one. And then diversity credit program, target market program, mentor protege program, and a phase graduation program. These are all intended to um, to help smaller businesses gain capacity and take advantage of their city contracting. The target market program is one, uh, particularly for certified firms, really good to keep an eye out for those. Those are ones in which only certified firms can respond to the solicitation. Um, the other ones are based uh, above that are, are largely around the size of a business, um, but that one is more about certification status. Mentor protege is really around uh, incentivizing prime contractors to actually work directly with smaller firms and help them uh, learn their business practices and, and grow as a, as a company. And then this last one, the phase graduation program, that just means that um, you know, smaller certified businesses are not penalized for for one or even just you know, two good years of business. It's uh, the actual size caps are evaluated over a longer time frame. So really, you only graduate out of certification status if you have sustained uh, financial success that um, you know are no longer considered disadvantaged in the same way that that smaller business. Right, and then bid incentives. So you'll see here we have a, a variety of different programs uh, through which uh, folks can have their base bid adjusted um, and, and hopefully uh, win out on, on a, a low bid contract. Um, there's there's ones for hiring veteran owned, uh, you know, smaller local businesses or or subcontracting to them. Um, similarly for for the BEPD certified businesses. We also incentivize city-based manufacturers and businesses um, by having them, if they fill out certain information and, and uh, actually are located here in the city, then we, we adjust their bids accordingly and, and hope to direct more dollars to local businesses. Uh, we have a couple other programs gained, gained to, are geared towards apprentice hiring, um, encouraging the use of alternatively powered vehicles, the mentor program, program I mentioned before, subcontractors from the project area, EEO, uh, other incentives around MBE, WBE programs, and then also ones related to the diverse workforce and management. Um, these are all uh, various ways that we try to incentivize certain practices amongst our contractors, and we do that by adjusting their bids if they provide certain information. Another piece here, uh, there was an executive order from the mayor in 2021 uh, requires all contractors to submit annual reports about their company's business diversity program. Um, that is, uh, it's a report that's due on July 1st of each calendar year from all city contractors, very limited exceptions. Uh, important to note here too, it is not a requirement that the contractors have various business diversity programs within their business. It is merely a requirement that they report to us uh, whether or not they do, 
and if they do, what does what is those uh, business to person programs actually? Right. Last, we'll get into uh, uh, some pieces on DPS website that I strongly encourage everyone watching to engage with and, and get as much additional information as they can. Um, the DPS website, we uh, post all awarded contracts and modifications, contractor payments, bid tabulations, um, all of those so that, you know, where the city is directing its dollars for, for its contractors and why all laid out and accessible to the public so that what we're doing is very transparent. Similarly, we also have a weekly bid opportunities, DPS alerts program so that um, each week you'll get a, you'll get a heads up about every, every bid opportunity coming out, um, being advertised so that you know, always know what opportunities are available to you. Um, similarly, we do have a searchable MBWBE directory if you're trying to find um, certain businesses to subcontract or partner with and with venture. Um, and then a kind of a various links to different bid incentive programs, regulations, other important contextual information so that you know to, uh, how to contract with the city and you can kind of look over in fine print all the details. Which... Thank you very much for that. I know I probably was a little bit long winded, but please do um, feel free to ask any questions that you might have about anything we've covered. So if you have any questions, feel free put, to put it in the Q&A panel. If you go to the right of your screen, you should have a Q percent A. You can put it in the Q&A panel. Um, we have one question. Uh, if you would like to write it there or I can unmike you and you can ask the question. I think it's at me. There was one hand that went up and I am trying to unmike you. You can go ahead and ask your question. The, um... uh, yeah, hello. Yes. Yes. Um yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And um thank you very much for this um, wonderful opportunity. And um my my question about this is um is that being uh you know I let me just use the word I am totally new to, you know, everything concerning, you know, these eating aspects and these eating formula and other things like that. But, you know, I've been able to attend one or two seminars around, in an, um, around Chicago. And that was where I actually, you know, fire um, about um, the, the city of Chicago and how I can be a part of, you know, meeting to start with more. So now, like, okay, I have a very, one of my questions goes thus. There is this bead um, concerning um, the janitorial service that I'm actually um, trying to offer. And, you know, I have some sections there where Ask for some, um, for some e high end whatever number, some other you know information that I know that I don't have. Despite the fact that I know I have my e high end number from the for my own business, and other registration that I've you know um, gotten for myself. But you know I still feel there are some things that they were asking that I do not have, and I'm like okay. Even after filling out all this form, will I still be considered or, you know, would um, even 
putting all these things together after going to the notary and notarize everything and still submitting it, how am I still sure I am going to be considered or would there still or can there still be um, a kind of a platform for, you know, for new people like or for upcoming, you know, contractors like, you know, people like me? or seminars that, you know, we can come in, you know, um, to attend and, you know, get spoken to by, you know, you know, people like you that have been into this business or into this venture for a long time, you know, because sincerely speaking, I'm just going to tell you, I'm still a little bit kind of confused, you know, with a lot of um, how the documentations really, you know, really work and how I'm actually going to be putting them together. Okay, we'll get uh, Patrick to answer. But Patrick, before you answer, can I uh, just jump in and say two things? Um, first of all, I think you're talking about the how to become certified process. Uh, are you certified currently? No, no, no. I'm not yet certified, ma'am. Okay. All right. Um, so there's a couple of things that I would say that I can help you out immensely first. And then I'll let Patrick jump in. <laughs> um, the first thing that I would actually say is um, we have a course, How to Become Certified. We have that course uh, the first week, pretty much in every month. Um, so I would say sign up for that. We actually had the course yesterday. Um, so, unfortunately, if you weren't able to join us yesterday, we will be um, putting up the um, YouTube tape of it, of the workshop that we had yesterday. But you can today go into YouTube.com, and I'll put all of this in um, the uh, chat area so you all know where to go get this. But you can go into YouTube.com backslash Chicago DPS and uh, click on um, the 2024 uh, pay, uh, playlist. If there is none in 2024, you can always go to 2023 um, because we are just now starting back doing workshops for 2024. So I will say in 2023, you will be able to see multiple versions of that How to Become Certified workshop why I'm pointing that out, it is because the questions sometimes differ because there are different people in the class um, from workshop to workshop. So sometimes you may find the questions that you have, the answers were given in different workshops. I would say first go and, and put yourself in that class, then view the uh, tape if you choose to do so. Uh, so that you can get a little bit uh, more understanding of what you'll need and then um, to be how to be prepared to become certified. Once then you are certified, we have um, a couple of different things, uh, resources that can help you. First of all, we have the buying plan where we put out quarterly that has information in the buying plan about uh, those types of services, professional um, services that are needed and what agencies or what government entity they're needed in. So that's a resource that I would suggest that you uh, do. The second or the third, because we have two times a year, we have workshops. Um, I'm not workshops, uh, we have events, outreach events. Uh, our largest one is the, the uh, symposium. We normally have that late summer, early fall, and that gives you information um, and resources. You are able to network with government entities. You know, we have a workshops going on there uh, that folks that, have been in our programs and now are primes. They come back and talk to uh, the other vendors and, and share what the challenges were, what the good things are, 
and uh, uh, and various other things. So I would say those will help educate you and help you move forward. Once you're certified, then we also have workshops on the bidding process, uh, which one of them should be coming up. Uh, I want to say it's next week, if I'm not mistaken, on Thursday uh, is e-procurement, but you can look at the schedule and, and double check me. Um, it is a e-procurement workshop which you understand how to put your information in to prepare yourself to put the data in that you have uh, so that you are bidding on the process, the, the different opportunities that you're looking for. So that's my take of it. I'll let um, um, Patrick take it from here and he can help you with some others. I, I second everything that uh, Jackie said just now. I, I would just add it's, um, if there's a particular, I think you mentioned a uh, janitorial services or some other specific uh, uh, bid opportunity available right now. Um, difficult for me to to comment directly on, on something that's open and particularly without without seeing what's required uh, in front of me just to on that one alone. But um, I would say on that, just don't hesitate to ask questions to the designated contact on that one as well. If you have questions about, you know. Who, whether your bid will be submitted if you leave, you know, X document um, out of your response. I think um, they're more than more than happy to work with you on that and to, to answer any questions you have while while that question period is open. Um, and then if there is a, just to add that if there is a pre bid conference or something like that, even if you're unsure about bidding, I mean, um, uh, it, feel free to attend those. Um, they can be. You know, networking opportunities, even if um, you're not getting the, the contractor itself, maybe you're in touch with, you end up being in touch with the person who ultimately does get the contract and that creates subcontracting opportunities, uh, particularly for certified firms. Um, so there, there's a, a few different ways there to get your foot in the door, even if it's not directly in contract with the city. So, um, and then I, in terms of just making sure your, your bids uh, considered, just, you know, feel free to to lay out what you are, you know, aren't capable of providing at this time and in and, and it and just ask the, the designated contact whether or not it would go to the afternoon. I think that's that's a helpful guide just for, for this stuff. And then one ad, added notation to that is we do have a department called Office Contracting Equity. And it at, in that department, they deal with certification and compliance, but along with uh, those things that they deal with, um, they uh, also received uh, what we call the business to business matchmaking. And so they will be putting on um, a, an event for those certified vendors that are uh, certified and they're trying to meet primes or trying to work with primes trying to joint venture with primes, uh, just want to talk with them to find out information, um, they will be putting on an event regarding that. So I would say if you're not on a DPS alert, stay tuned. Uh, you need to be uh, because that's where the information is distributed and you, you will uh, get a chance uh, to, um, you know, say what you need at that time. Um, I think, Patrick, there was a question that was uh, in the Q&A. Uh, what if you are a startup company and wants to engage with uh, the city? Uh, the company will apply to be an MBE, however, does not meet the eligibility requirements just yet. Um, I have previous construction experience in the field, but as a startup, I do not meet the eligibility requirements. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it, and I think a lot of that is, um, you know, working towards the certification status, um, trying you know, to find, uh, particularly in the buying plan or DPS alerts, some of these projects will be smaller in size and scope too. So, so maybe it's, um, those, those are ones that you could actually uh, access as a startup or, or early stage of a business. Um, actually access and, and um, 
and bid on without without having to invest too much in that and, and risk too much. Um, and then the other side of that too, the I think Jackie and I both touched on business to business matchmaking and and networking type of programs. Um, certification status is definitely going to be important there in terms of incentivizing larger companies to subcontract with you. But those are you know, subcontracting um, and really what we try to uh, gear the programs towards if, if they're most successful, it's when a, a subcontractor can grow and build capacity so that they can then be the prime contractors on a contract. So if you're looking for a place to start, I would say try to identify you know small and, and more reasonable contracting opportunities with the city. It's something that you try to do, break down projects into you know, smaller bite-sized pieces so that folks do uh, have the ability to, to do the work on them as well. Um, but also uh, networking with other larger businesses that can kind of maybe bring, bring you along with them um, and, and allow you to build a business that way. I think those are probably the two main, uh, main answers. Are there any additional questions that Patrick can answer? For you, feel free to put it in the Q and A, uh, and we will definitely answer those for you. Uh, if there are, I'm, Patrick, I'm just trying to give them a few extra minutes uh, to write in case they have uh, questions or anything that uh, they would like to have answered. Um, if there are no additional questions, then we are going to uh, close out the session, but not until, um, you know, I give them a few extra minutes to put any questions in. But I would say for anybody who uh, hasn't signed up for uh, the um, uh, DPS alerts, I would say do that. Uh, I am putting in the Q&A panel, um, or maybe I'll put it in the chat panel to everyone. Maybe I'll do that. Um, I'll put in the chat panel to all of you uh, information where you can go to find the buying plan, where you can find um, additional workshops if you're interested, or the PowerPoints after this session is over. I would say review it, um, you know, go along with it with uh, the archive of uh, Patrick. He will be up after it comes out and you can go through it with uh, the PowerPoint so that you are aware of uh, what is needed and what's going on and what we have here to help you. Some of the wonderful resources and, um, you know, if you have any further questions, after uh, today, feel free to uh, uh, email dps.events um, and we will definitely, dps, I'm sorry, dps.events at city of Chicago, all one word, dot org. So you would type in city of Chicago dot org. Um, again, that's uh, dps.events. Um, and I, I think if not, I will put that in the chat too, uh, just so that, uh, you have it. There is an evaluation after this workshop, and we would like to know if these, uh, courses are helpful, uh, or what topics we could talk about with you, uh, to help you get where you need to be. So if you feel that there's um, any content that we're not covering, feel free. Uh, I am the one who reads them. Uh, so feel free to um, put it on your evaluation and we will be more than glad to research it, come up with the program and then roll it out. And we will announce it on DPS alerts so that you know that there's a new workshop coming out. Um, let's see, anything else you didn't cover? Where can I find more information on the mentorship program? Great question. I think on that, um, I would say start with the programs and incentives uh, resource guide. So you can find that at um, 
Oh, check me. Uh, Jack, Chicago, Chicago's that <laughs> love backslash DPS. And then we have a litany of icons there. You can just click on the one um, that says, I think there is one that says a resource guide. Um, you can click on that, or you can go up to the quick links and click on resource guides. Either one, it'll get you there. And I do agree. Uh, you can read that information there. You always can type anything in. If you got confused of what I just said or where to go, just type in City of Chicago Mentorship Program, and it will definitely come up with the link for you. Are there any additional questions? And I think we answered the one about the presentation after today. They will be put up online, uh, and then you will be able to see this archive uh, video um, by tomorrow because it takes a little time for the tape to uh, uh, free itself and come back to me, and then I have to post it. So uh, you will see it uh, by tomorrow. All right, thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for spending a little time with us and talking about procurement fundamentals and how they can do business with the city. We wish you all well. We hope that to see you uh, bidding on contracts very soon. Or those of you that are not quite ready, getting ready so that you can bid on contracts. And we hope that you're going online and taking a look at uh, the buy-in plan so that you are able to see what's out there to bid on uh, and uh, uh, get started bidding at that time. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay safe, stay well, and we will see you at the next workshop. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Jackie. Thanks, everyone.